broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web. You're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Relax Radio listeners, I'm your host, Dan Reardon, with our co-host, Dr. Krishna. He is the founder of Relax.org, and I'm the president of Relax.org. You can download our app from the App Store and or Play Store, and you can visit us at relaxx.org. With us today is Tom Morris. Tom is one of the world's top public philosophers and pioneering business thinkers. He's an author of over 30 books and a legendary speaker. I've personally watched multiple of his YouTubes and can attest to his wonderful presence on the stage, and I've been really looking forward to having this moment with him today. Uh, His latest book is called Plato's Lemonade Stand, Steering Change into Something Great. And, boy, do we all need great things to happen with all the change we're facing today. So, Tom, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you, and let's dive right in. That sounds great, uh, Dan. I'm so glad to be with you today. Fantastic. So, Tom, uh, first thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, the deepest wisdom of the great practical philosophers on how to move from difficulty to delight. I know you've dove into that and have some real key insights around it, and I wanted to have you share that with everybody. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to. You know, it's funny. I was a philosophy professor at the University of Notre Dame for many years, and business groups started asking me to give talks because they heard my classes were popular at Notre Dame. And at first they were asking me to talk about ethics or success or some of the topics that we, you know, often hear people speak on at big conferences and conventions. But I had spoken two or three times to a big bank, NBNA Bank. Uh, I think at the time they were the largest issuer of credit cards in the nation. I'd spoken to them on a topic called True Success from a book I did by the same title. I'd spoken to them uh, from another book I did called If Aristotle Ran General Motors. And maybe I'd given a third talk. They called me one day and said, look, we're being bought by Bank of America. And the day the deal goes through, our president, our CEO, gets many millions of dollars, but the rest of us don't even know if we're going to have a job the day after that. And she said... Morale is terrible. It's the greatest difficulty and uncertainty we've ever faced. Could you give us a talk on how to deal with difficult change? And rather than saying, well, I've never really researched that and I kind of don't know much about it, I said, sure, I'd be happy to. That's the kind of the secret of my life as a philosopher. Whenever anybody asks me to do something, I don't say, you're calling the wrong guy. I don't know anything about that. I tend to say, sure, that's fine. I'll look into it. And so I did some amazing research for about six months on dealing with difficulty. And, you know, we've been talking for a long time about resilience, which is basically bouncing back. When something bad happens, you know, bounce back. The resilient people succeed over the long run. And resilience is very important. Uh, and we've, for the last ten years we've been talking about another thing, um, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Angela Duckworth, uses the word grit. You know, it's important for success to, to have grit, to have persistence. You know, when difficult things happen, you know, soldier on, grit your teeth, keep going, you can do it. But I thought to myself, I grew up hearing everybody say, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. And I thought about this. I thought, well, making lemonade is not just bouncing back. Making lemonade is not just having grit and soldiering on. When life ends, you lemons make lemonade. That says, that says don't just deal with it. Turn difficulty into something delightful. And so I thought to myself, how is that even possible? Because everybody was saying that when I was growing up, you know, when life ends, you lemons make lemonade. Nobody said how. So I did 
years of research after the talk for MBNA. I did six months of research for them. I gave a talk, got a standing ovation. Everybody said, you've changed the entire atmosphere here at the bank. Uh, it was their top 750 people. They said, we can't thank you enough. One lady came up to me and said, I was an Olympic swimmer. You said in 45 minutes what my coach tried to say in 15, min in 15 years and never could. So people were responding so powerfully to this little talk. I kept researching the topic, and I wrote a book based on those ideas uh, called Plato's Lemonade Stand. It took me 15 years to write the book. I rewrote it 25 times. It had six different titles. It got rejected 44 times by publishers, <laughs> and yet I made the greatest lemonade of my life. I think it's my favorite book I've ever done. It's been out for a year now, and I get letters from people like no letters I've ever gotten before. The philosophers had some simple advice about how to work transformatively on any troubles and difficulties and adversities that come our way. You, you want to hear a quickie on what they had to say, Dan? Uh, absolutely, and i got to tell you, I, uh, it's admirable what you just said about the rewriting it 25 times and the 40-plus <laughs> uh, rejections. What a story. Yeah, my first book I wrote when I was 22, it was rejected 36 times, and I became an author at the age of, at the age of 22 because I did not give up. So I've learned sometimes, and those publishers who rejected Plato's Lemonade Stand never said a single bad word about it. They just said, we're not sure people are in the mood for philosophy right now. Could you write a book on politics? This was a few years ago, you know. And I said, no, I think we need this book, and so I kept at it. But it's funny, I had to use the advice in the book to get the book written and published, which is really a nice thing. Uh, basically, it's like this. Whenever you go to play golf, you go to play tennis, you first walk on the course, you first walk on the court, you're not going to be great. You've got to learn certain skilled behaviors. There's the art of the swing. There's the art of the backhand in tennis, the art of the forehand. Well, the philosophers told me there's an art of change, and it consists of three really simple arts, the art of self-control, the art of positive action, and the art of achievement. And each of these things has a few requirements. The art of self-control, whenever anything bad happens, people say, oh, no, this is terrible, this is awful. The philosophers say, number one, don't rush to judgment. Hardly anything in this world is what it at first appears. So just calm down. You know, there are so many people who will tell me over the years, getting fired was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think back to the day that they were fired, they probably weren't saying, you know, they walk into their office and the executive vice president comes in and says, I've got some news for you. We're having to do some layoffs. I'm sorry your job's been eliminated. Then probably the guy who's hearing this didn't say, oh, this is, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Thank you so much. Can I call my wife? No, you can't use the phone anymore. Oh, that's even better. It didn't play out like that. He probably thought, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, I have bills to, to pay. I have kids in school. But later he tells me it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So the philosophers say don't rush to judgment, number one. Number two, value the right things. If we only value safety and security, we're not going to react too well to disruptive change. But if we value adventure and growth and learning, we're going to say, oh, this is, this is really interesting. It's a new adventure. I, I, I know a guy who likes to say nothing happened to me. Everything happens for me. Now, there's a guy who's going to value the right things, and because of his values, you know, he's going to grow, he's going to learn. No matter how difficult the situation seems at first, he's got, he's got the values my father gave to me. My father said, life is supposed to be a series of adventures. The one you're on now is preparing you for the next one, often in ways you can't even imagine. So be positive, live the adventure. Uh, the philosophers also said, number three, use your imagination well. Whenever anything difficult happens, our imaginations take control of us. We imagine the worst possible case scenarios. If we can turn that around and try to imagine positive outcomes of the situation instead, it can really empower us to look for the opportunities hidden inside the challenges. So the philosophers said, number one, the art of self-control. Much simpler, the art of positive action. First of all, you've established some control. You're not going crazy. You're not freaking out. But then they say, okay, 
really work on governing your attitude, trying to take a positive attitude in the situation. Then look for opportunities. If you're worried, if you're fearful, if you're stressed out, you're not going to see opportunities that are staring you in the face. But if you calm down, the art of self-control, you're governing your attitude, you're not complaining all the time, you look for opportunities. And when you, every time a change involves opportunities, so then they say take the initiative. Number three, take the initiative. Take action. In every period of human challenge, whether it's pandemics or wars or recessions, some people have prospered and flourished. It's because they did these things. They took new actions. And then the philosophers say that once you're taking action, you want the third art, the art of achievement, which is there's seven simple things you need to have as a checklist. You need to have a clear conception of what you want to make happen in the situation. Don't just be a passive victim. Be an active goal setter. Have a strong confidence that you can move forward, even if you don't know exactly what's going to happen next. The greatest athletes have taught me that they don't depend on their circumstances for confidence. They bring their confidence to the circumstances, and that makes all the difference in the world. Number three, we need to focus concentration on what it's going to take uh, to, to deal with the situation well. You know, we need to focus, we need to concentrate, which is you can't do that if you're, if you're too emotionally worked up. That's why the art of self-control came first. We need a stubborn consistency in pursuing our vision of, of what we think we can make of this situation. We need uh, an emotional commitment to the importance of what we're doing. Uh, the commitment of the heart takes people through the most difficult of times. Uh, number six, we need a good character to guide us and keep us on proper course. Uh, don't cut corners. Don't go into the gray areas. Don't do things that you, you, you'll be ashamed of later or feel bad about later. You know, let good character guide you along the way. And then number seven, the seventh condition for success is we need a capacity to enjoy the process. No matter what difficulties we face, there are going to be things about the process that we can enjoy. And, Dan, I've really learned that if we do those three arts, if we practice them, the art of self-control, the art of positive action, and the art of achievement, we can turn the biggest, most sour lemon into the most amazing lemonade, even if we're, we're rejected 44 times along the way. <laughs> so, yeah. Tom, Tom, I loved your story about, you know, like when something happens to you, you are fired or, or something that looks so bad at that time. I have a series of those things in my life where it sounded like I'm going to go down and suddenly I was better. Um, oh, yeah. But one thing, one thing I say, Tom, you have come out of classroom philosophy to kind of corporate and brought the philosophy in real life. Why yeah. did you want Aristotle to run General Motors? I mean, what was the... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not a you ask that, Dr. K. It's funny you ask that because I did my first uh, non-academic book. I've done 11 academic books for Oxford Press and Cornell Press, books 34 people in the world could understand, basically. And then I was asked by business groups, is there anything deeper about success? They, they would say to me, we have motivational speakers every year who say, set goals, aim high, believe in yourself. And that all sounds really good, and it, it's important, but is there anything deeper as well? And I said, well, let me look into it, you know. Again, my recipe is to never say, well, I don't know. My recipe is to say, that's interesting. Let me, let me look into it. Let me see if I can find out something good. And so I did a book called True Success. It's about goal setting. It is the wisdom of all the great philosophers about how to do it well, how to set and, and, and pursue your goals and attain your goals. And then a year or two after the book came out, I thought to myself, you know, but there's another side of success in addition to goal setting. There's relationship building because nobody ever has great success alone. I mean, the fact that, that Dan, you, and, and Krishna are co-hosts of this show just kind of demonstrates what, I, what I'm talking about. It's an amazing thing. I, at the time, in the mid-'90s, all businesses were talking about product quality and process efficiency, but nobody was talking about the spirit of the people who do the work. And so I decided to go back to Aristotle and all the other great philosophers and find their deepest wisdom on what do people need to have great relationships at work as well as at home to really feel invested in what they're doing, to feel a sense of fulfillment and happiness in their work, 
and that generated the book if Aristotle ran General Motors. So you're right. I mean, for a long time, I was just dealing with the questions that philosophers talk about with each other, but nobody else really cares much about. But I decided <laughs> as a philosopher, I was going to do something that hadn't been done in a very long time. I was going to listen to people outside the university life. I was going to ask them the problems they were actually experiencing, and I was going to find the wisdom to help them live better lives. And it's been the most fun. I've been doing it now for 30 years, and it's been an amazing experience. I'm sorry to go off the track and questions, but you know Plato, you know Socrates, and you know Aristotle better than anyone on this planet. In relationship, who was the kind of, who is the person, you know, shines up as far as relationship is concerned, you know? Is that Aristotle? That's why you brought him. Yeah, I kept Rangel. coming. I, yeah, I really, I draw on a lot of different philosophers in that book, but I kept coming back to Aristotle giving me my solutions to difficult problems. Now, he's not the easiest philosopher to read because his books that you'll find in a bookstore, like his, uh, his Nicomachean Ethics or his Eudamian Ethics, they even have Greek, Greek names, uh, they're not the easiest thing to read because they were his notes for his advanced classes. He didn't write a book for everybody to read. His notes got published after his death. But Socrates, give you an example. Socrates has a simple formula I mean, Aristotle has a simple formula. I think he learned from Plato who learned from Socrates. Aristotle has a simple formula uh, for the height of human uh, performance and experience. It's very simple and it's very powerful. It's people, plural, people in partnership in a certain kind of relationship with a shared purpose. People in partnership for a shared purpose. Those words are not exactly to be found in that order in his famous book, The Politics. But if you read The Politics dip, deeply, you understand that's what he's saying. People in partnership for a shared purpose. We're never going to feel our best or do our best without partners. We need partners. Collaboration is so important in life, in the history of innovation and creativity, in the history of any flourishing business. And we can't really partner up powerfully unless we have a shared purpose. So that's the kind of stuff I would get from Aristotle all the time. It would always blow my mind and say, you know, Aristotle even asked about what's a city? Is a city a bunch of buildings? Is a city a bunch of people in buildings? He said, no, a city is people in partnership for a shared purpose. That's what a city is. So if a city forgets that, if a country forgets that, if a corporation forgets that they are supposed to be in partnership for a shared purpose, things are going to start going badly. We only flourish when we have that sense of our lives together. In fact, uh, Aristotle's understanding of politics was just it's how best to live well together. And we need to bring that, those, uh, that lens, that framework, that, in, that, that, that way of viewing everything we do. How best can we do this together? Then we have flourishing enterprises. And Aristotle was always my guide. Man, Tom, there's a lot of phenomenal wisdom in those <laughs> first 15 minutes of the discussion. I tell you, I took a lot of notes myself. One of the things that really stood out to me early on was, you know, the rushing to judgment and don't rush to judgment. That one has been such a phenomenal lesson to me over the last 10 years of my life when I really started to figure that out. And it's such a key to calming everything down. So I was really happy to hear you punch that one out. Another question yeah, yeah. that I, ha I had for you was, this one's a funny one, but you made mention about your favorite book was, of all time, is A Little Princess. And <laughs> I just had to have you tell us the story behind that because it sounded so interesting. <laughs> Oh, you know, it's a, it's a book that I think my daughter or my granddaughter had bought. It, it was a book published in 1905, and um, it's by an author, uh, a, a lady named Frances uh, Hodgson Burnett. I had never heard of the book, A Little Princess, but I saw it in one of the rooms in our house on a shelf with some other famous books that I had heard of uh, that my, my family was reading. And I thought, well, what is this? I picked it up and sat down on the sofa. I almost read it cover to cover in one sitting. It was so interesting because it's exactly about appearances and realities. 
this little girl goes through a sequence of situations that look like she's, her life is going from bad to worse. But in the end, everything works out in such a beautiful way. It teaches you again the lesson she had to learn about not rushing to judgment. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's funny because there are so many other books that touch on the same theme. Um, the founder of Whole Foods, John Mackey, is a, is a good personal friend. And about a month ago, he said, Tom, one of my favorite books I want to recommend to you. And I said, what is that? He said, you ever heard of the author John Barth? And I said, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. He said he did a book called The Sockweed Factor that you need to read, a, a novel. <laughs> and so I said, okay, John, I'll order it. So I ordered this book. It comes in the mail. It's 756 pages long. Now, don't recommend to your friends a book that's 756 pages long. <laughs> Sockweed sock was the name in the 17th century for tobacco, and a factor was a person who sold tobacco in the early American colonies. It's a book about a bunch of Brits who come to Maryland and, and the adventures they go through. It's like a little princess in that things get worse and worse and worse, but everything that looks terrible, everything that seems to be one way, turns out to be almost the exact opposite. Don't rush to judgment. In fact, in my own novel, once, uh, when we come back from our break, I'll tell you a, a, an image that has helped me more than anything else not to rush to judgment. Oh, man, that's great. Well, you had perfect timing on that. We're going to take a quick break here at Relax Radio, and we'll be right back with Tom to dive into a little bit more of his insight. If you want the most compelling, universally available platform in the practicing of meditation, mindfulness, and intermittent silence, then you need to know about the app called Relax.org. That's Relax with two X's, because when you go to this app, you really do relax. It helps your body, quiets your mind, and connects you to your flame in the world of consciousness. It's always with you, so you can use it any time. Isn't this your time to be peaceful, happy, and prosperous? Find out more at relax.org. If you're looking for unique items at affordable prices, then you should try Dream Product. From apparel to beauty, from shoes to therapeutic relief products, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on Dream Products, and maybe your dreams might just come into reality. Imagine living everyday life on purpose. Now imagine yourself easily navigating through life's changes and stress from a soul level. For insights into the journey of the human soul, let Dr. Krishna Bada be your guide. His book, Journey from Life to Life, will help you demystify life, death, and everything in between. It gives you clarity on how you can have a successful life and a smooth transition into the world beyond. Who wouldn't want that? Get Journey from Life to Life by Krishna Bada, MD, at Amazon.com. You have too little time to shop, so try Farm Fresh to you. They deliver organic food the way nature intended, delivered straight to your home or office, economically. Visit our web advertiser page and click on Farm Fresh to you now. Feel like the super person you are meant to be? It's easy at liveandbreathesolutions.com. They don't just talk about healthy living. Their superfoods are combined with products you use daily, so you're actually getting a healthy living at great prices, too. Imagine chocolate, gluten-free, organic snacks, mixes, and ingredients, all but a click away at liveandbreathesolutions.com. So make life simple to be healthier. Just live and breathe and go to liveandbreathesolutions.com. This is Jack Maher from the band Feed the Kitty. It's important to support the artists you love, and you can do that and get something authentic for yourself. Rock.com has the most coveted, licensed merchandise of music, culture, and entertainment. So go to the advertiser page and click on Rock.com now. Make your day start out right. Coffee and tea are what most people need to help start their day. So it's no secret that you want the very best taste. That's where CoffeeandChai.com comes in. They're proud to display a variety of coffee and tea from all over the world. They have a wonderful assortment of coffee flavors and talk about teas. They have all kinds for the body, mind, and soul, which are great to drink any time of day. Visit CoffeeNChai.com now. That's coffee, the letter N, Chai.com. CoffeeNChai.com. Back to 
Relax Radio. This is Dan Reardon, your host with co-host Dr. K and our guest, Tom. We are back for some additional questions and insight. And one of the things we wanted to dive into first was having Tom talk to us a little about disruptive change and uncertainty and how it makes room for new forms of creativity and other unexpected masters of innovations and thoughts and things that can come about from this disruption. So, Tom, give us the insight there. You know, I was I was writing some novels a few years ago. I ended up writing eight novels, which I had never expected, and they came to me like a movie in my playing in my head. And, uh, the main character, my Dumbledore, my Gandalf, a wise old man uh, in Egypt in 1934, as a matter of fact, he says at one point in the story that he's traveling across the desert with his nephew, and his nephew says, "I'm really worried about all the uncertainty we face in our lives right now," and his uncle says to his to the young boy who's 13 years old, he, he said, have you ever considered the possibility that uncertainty is a gift? And as soon as I type this, I'm hearing this in my head, I'm typing this, and I'm, I stopped and thought, what? Uncertainty as a gift? What does this even mean? Well, fortunately, the character goes on to talk about it. It's almost as if he says uncertainty is an open field of possibility. If everything were mapped out and we knew what was going to happen next, where would be our freedom? Where would be our opportunities for creativity and innovation? If we were like trains running on a, 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 an iron rail, where would be our personal freedom whatsoever? The more uncertainty there is, the more open the possibilities are for us. It's almost like a blank canvas. A painter loves a blank canvas because he has infinitely many possibilities. And, 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 and so this character in my novel taught me it's an open field of possibility. Secondly, it's a garden of self-knowledge. I learn the most about myself when I am confronting uncertainty because I see how I react, and I come to realize all kinds of things about my confidence, about my expectations, about how I view the world. So it's an open field of possibilities. It's a garden of self-knowledge. The old catapult that used to launch people over castle walls, it uncertainty is a catapult of self-cultivation. When I'm in a situation of uncertainty and I'm worried and I'm anxious, I realize I've got to get busy. I've got to cultivate myself a little bit better. I've got to, I've got to cultivate my self-confidence. I can't wait for the circumstances to give me self-confidence. I've got to bring my self-confidence to the circumstances, as we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, disruptive change opens a doorway to all sorts of possibilities that might have been closed off before. So in the past year of this awful pandemic, I have seen more creativity in business. Some people have even said the digital revolution has been, uh, has been uh, 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 fed up by at least five years because we've learned to do things in new ways, largely because we had to. We were facing so much uncertainty. We had to, we were bushwhackers having to make our own trails in the jungle, not depending on the roads that were already out there, all of which were blocked suddenly. So I've learned to view uh, disruptive change as almost a partner. It's a funny thing, but it, uh, not too long ago it occurred to me maybe a problem isn't something to regret, but a problem can be something to embrace. Maybe I actually need to partner up with my problems to see what they have to teach me about what might be next in my life. I wrote a little book about Steve Jobs called Socrates in Silicon Valley. And a friend of mine who's from India read the book, and he said, oh, your insights are so great about Steve Jobs, things I never thought of before. He said, you taught me that Steve Jobs, that this is very important, the problems we have to deal with in our lives, form who we become. The problems we choose to take on may be the things that define us in our lives. And I said, wow, he said, Steve Jobs, I hadn't even realized that I talked about this in a way that would spur these realizations to my friend. He said, Steve Jobs picked problems big enough for his own spirit to solve, and that's why he was so successful. I said, wow, so he's not a guy who just dealt with disruption. He created disruption in every industry he entered 
because he was willing to try new things. It's an awesome, an awesome story. Yeah. Tell me your... Boy, you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, Tom, okay. I, mean, I like the thing you said, you know, the stories came to you. And and the book title you have, Oasis Within, um, I don't know what you meant by that, but we at Relax, we m- mentioned about the inner universe where all these ideas are floating around, and if you let them flow to you, they will come to yep. you, and solutions will yep. come to you. So yep. that's, uh, that's interesting. You know, sometimes we try too hard. That's why I talk about partnering up with a problem. Sometimes when we face a big problem, we go into crisis mode, and we get almost too active in trying to figure out the solution, whereas sometimes the first thing we should be doing is to relax, listen to the problem, pay attention to the problem, dwell, let it dwell, sit with the problem. I mean, there's a, there's a story in the Jewish and Christian Bible about, the, about Job, a man who had terrible things happen to him, and his friends came to comfort him, and they kept coming up with bad solutions or explanations of his problem. Almost everything, they, they were just talking, talking, talking. Almost everything they came up with was, was really nonsense. What they really need to do is just sit with him and sit with the problem a while and be open. I've learned at my age, I'm 68 now, I finally learned how to get out of my own way and let the deeper wisdom come to me, and then that gives me the solution to the problem I face. That's so profound. That's, uh, that's what we are trying to say, but it's, you communicated it so well. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. And maybe in a little bit we talk more about the Oasis Within because it's one of the most revolutionary writing experiences uh, I've ever had. But everything in my life is somehow connected. And it's, uh, my father gave me my best piece of advice when I was a little boy. He said, life is supposed to be a series of adventures. The one you're on now is preparing you for the next one, and often in ways you can't even imagine. So that's kind of given me a confidence about life and about whatever adventure comes next. Okay, let's, let's see where, where it leads. Yeah, a really great way to think about it. It's something you just connected some additional dots for me is, as I started to more deeply question things both in business world and personal life in food and nutrition, I realized that the instability, the uncertainty that the questioning services is something that a lot of people aren't comfortable in that questioning process, so they'd rather just not question anything so that they can remain stable and certain. And when you were saying that garden of self-knowledge and that uncertainty yeah. as a gift, I've said that questioning is actually the greatest adventure that you could ever yeah. give yourself. Because the more you question, it, you have no idea where it's going to lead you, but it's this amazing world that opens up to you. And I just connected some additional dots there through your process that you took us through. So that was really amazing. <laughs> that, really that, fun. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. Well, the questions are questions are the most important tools, some of the most important tools we have. And like any tool uh, that can be used well or badly, so can questions. So some people come to fear questions because they think they're, they are too disruptive. They're going to shake up their lives too much. But if you view questions in a positive way, we talk about solving problems. Sometimes we don't even know what problems to tackle until we've asked a lot of deep questions about the situation we're in. So if you can ask good questions, that's why Socrates was famous not for answers. Socrates was famous for asking deep and challenging questions because that's the way to find the way forward. It's almost like you're, everybody's in the dark, and when you start asking good questions, you begin to turn on a flashlight to help everybody see their way forward. Uh, that's perfect. Tom, we're going to take a short break. And we'll be right back with Tom and Relax Radio. Your world is colored with beliefs, values, and illusions, which interpret how you process the signals you receive from others. Now there's a way in which you can quickly learn how to interpret these signals correctly and without self-sabotaging yourself in the process. In Dan Reardon's book, Signals Proven Methods will help you see things more clearly so you can act with purpose and achieve your goals while attaining a more peaceful, happy life. 
Get your copy of Signals by Dan Reardon today at Amazon.com or wherever fine books are sold. This is Jack Maher from the band Feed the Kitty. It's important to support the artists you love, and you can do that and get something authentic for yourself. Rock.com has the most coveted, licensed merchandise of music, culture, and entertainment. So go to the advertiser page and click on Rock.com now. If you want the most compelling, universally available platform in the practicing of meditation, mindfulness, and intermittent silence, then you need to know about the app called Relax.org. That's Relax with two X's, because when you go to this app, you really do relax. It helps your body, quiets your mind, and connects you to your flame in the world of consciousness. It's always with you, so you can use it any time. Isn't this your time to be peaceful, happy, and prosperous? Find out more at relax.org. Get high-quality glasses, sunglasses, and prescription lenses at eyeglasses.com. Choose from over 250,000 items and 400 brands. Already have frames? Get replacement lenses. It's easy. Go to our advertiser page and click eyeglasses.com. Imagine living everyday life on purpose. Now imagine yourself easily navigating through life's changes and stress from a soul level. For insights into the journey of the human soul, let Dr. Krishna Bada be your guide. His book, Journey from Life to Life, will help you demystify life, death, and everything in between. It gives you clarity on how you can have a successful life and a smooth transition into the world beyond. Who wouldn't want that? Get Journey from Life to Life by Krishna Bada, MD, at Amazon.com. HealthyLife.net, where positive overcomes negative. Welcome back to Relax Radio. I am your host, Dan Reardon, with co-host Dr. Krishna, and Tom is back with us for some additional comments and insight. Dr. K, take it away. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Tom, it's so wonderful to um, be here as your co-host, you know, for Relax Radio. We were talking about the oasis within, and as I mentioned in the break, uh, many people feel that silence is an empty, nothing, negative space, whereas it probably is as full of energy and uh, creativity um, that actually comes and displays in the outer world for us. Yeah. So can you yeah. make some comments and relationship with your book? Yeah, I, I'd love to. I mean, I was supposed to be working on Plato's Lemonade Stand. I was sitting at breakfast one morning. I just finished breakfast, pushing back my chair to go upstairs to my study and type a chapter you know, or revise a chapter in my book. But all of a sudden, I had the most vivid daydream of my life. Now, I'm a daydreamer, but this was... The, daydream times 20. It was the most vivid daydream I've ever had. It was like a dream at night, but I'm wide awake at the breakfast table. All of a sudden, I'm seeing in my mind's eye an old man and a young boy sitting in the desert somewhere, and they're having a conversation. I'm hearing this conversation. I run upstairs and type 10 pages, put it on Huffington Post, and within minutes started getting emails from all over the world. What is this? What is this? Is this from a book? This is great. I said, I don't know what it is. It's just a conversation I heard in my head this morning. Second, the next day, another 10 pages. The next day, I see the title. I wake up, open my eyes, and see the title of a book called The Oasis Within. Well, not many days had to pass before I realized, you know what? The movie is not going to play in my head. That, that's what it was like. I mean, Mary Shelley wrote her famous book, Frankenstein. She said it was like it was like a waking dream. That's what it was like for me. It was like a, but she couldn't talk about movies because she was writing in the 1800s. It was like a movie in my head, but the movie would stop playing unless I got really quiet. I had never been a successful person in meditation, but I had been a guitar player in rock bands, and I used the image of turning down the volume control to zero. And I learned from one of the characters in my book, he talks about the chatter of the mind the clutter of our conscious mind. He says you have to get beyond the clutter, you have to get beneath the chatter, and that's where the real treasure is to be found. I would sit at my desk and turn down the volume of my mental chatter to zero for a one minute, one minute of silence, 
And then the movie would start playing, and I would type for six hours, nonstop. I learned every day that if I had a little silence, because here's what it's like. Imagine somebody gives you a great bottle of wine, and you've got your wine glass. You know your wine glass is on the is on the table. So you, you take this bottle, you open the cork, you go over to the table, and your glass is full of mud and muddy water. Well, you're not going to be able to pour any wine in that glass. You've got to clean it out. You've got to empty it out. And then there's room for the great wine to be poured. It was like I had to make room in my heart, my soul, my mind for all the creative ideas that were waiting to come my way, but they couldn't because there was no room. So silence, or what some people call spiritual emptiness, is a way of inviting into your life deep wisdom, creative ideas, new insights you never could have imagined having. So the movie played in my head for five years and created eight volumes of a story of over a million words set in Egypt in 1934 and 1935. Uh, act, people have, have called these novels uh, Harry Potter meets Indiana Jones meets Aristotle. And I think it's the most powerful stuff I've ever written as a, as a philosopher. I've been having correspondence every day with a young man in Bucharest, Romania, who's 15 years old, who just read all eight of those novels, The Oasis Within and all the rest, and it's changed his life. He's become a deeply philosophical person. Now, why the title? They're at an oasis when my story begins, and the boy doesn't want to leave because he's enjoying the rest of relaxation there. And the old man says to him, you can take with you, my friend, an oasis wherever you go. And the boy says, how do I do that? And the old man says, let me tell you. And that's how the story begins. Very powerful. That, yeah, that is really powerful and really interesting. And I love uh, the analogy of taking it uh, wherever you go, it's um, so so pertinent and so real for many of us. Um, it, Dr. It, K, did you have no, follow-ups on that around intermittent silence? Tom, I think we might have lost Dr. K. I thought he was just giving us a little okay. piece of intermittent silence right there. <laughs> okay, I'm here yeah. now. Yeah, ah. I was saying that uh, in our intermittent silence, we say that you go to the source, find the force, feel the force, and then bring it with you, and it's, you know it stays yeah. with you. And that energy is maybe one energy that transforms into different flows. It could be creativity, yeah. it could be music, it could be a book. Um, so that's what we are saying. But Tom, you put yeah. it so it's well. Oh, thank you. You know, Christian, it's, it's, it's become a big part of my life because I was a person, especially as a, first, as a public speaker, and I've done over 1,200 public talks. You become such a talker, you tend to fill every silence with words. And yet the Greek, I mean, the, 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 the Roman philosopher Epictetus, who was one of the great Stoic philosophers, you know, he was the first to say God gave us two ears and one mouth, and we should use them in suitable proportion. And I have, I have learned to listen, and sometimes the silence is what's going to speak most deeply to whatever condition uh, I'm in. We have to learn to slow down. We have to learn to get out of our own ways. We have to learn to listen. It's a spiritual discipline that pays off in every aspect of our lives. But too many people can't do it because they're just too worried. They're too anxious. They're too worked up about everything. And the old man in my novel said something really interesting. He asked his nephew, have you ever seen a telescope? Now, they're from a small village in Egypt. The boy said, yeah, I saw one. I looked through it. It made things look big and close by. And the old man said, when I was your age, I had a, somebody gave me a telescope. And, yes, you're right. It makes things look big and close. But then I turned the telescope around, and I looked through the other end, and it shrank things down to size and made close things look far away. We all have a, a, a telescope within us that we can turn around. When bad things happen, we make them too big and too close. Turn your telescope around, shrink them down to size, and give yourself time. Yeah, I love that you mentioned uh, Epictetus. He's one of my favorite uh, philosophers, and one of his quotes <laughs> 
you cannot learn what you think you already know is one that I have come to hold very close and use it to uh, challenge myself in meetings, in personal, everywhere, um, to test. Am I am I stuck in what I think I already know, or am I open to new information? So it's great. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we're going to take another quick break from Relax Radio, and we'll be right back with Tom for our final segment. Explore your inner universe with your own portable guru. You'll discover the benefits of intermittent silence, meditation, and mindfulness, which will help you in every area of your life. At Relax.org, you'll learn to conserve, channel, and use your energy in constructive ways while helping to keep your body healthy and your mind relaxed. Relax.org is your chance to consistently experience stress-free, purposeful living at its best. Where is this portable guru? At Relax.org. That's Relax with two X's. Feel like the super person you are meant to be? It's easy at liveandbreathesolutions.com. They don't just talk about healthy living. Their superfoods are combined with products you use daily, so you're actually getting a healthy living at great prices, too. Imagine chocolate, gluten-free organic snacks, mixes, and ingredients, all but a click away at liveandbreathesolutions.com. So make life simple to be healthier. Just live and breathe and go to liveandbreathesolutions.com. Your world is colored with beliefs, values, and illusions, which interpret how you process the signals you receive from others. Now there's a way in which you can quickly learn how to interpret these signals correctly and without self-sabotaging yourself in the process. In Dan Reardon's book, Signals Proven Methods will help you see things more clearly so you can act with purpose and achieve your goals while attaining a more peaceful, happy life. Get your copy of Signals by Dan Reardon today at Amazon.com or wherever fine books are sold. Imagine living everyday life on purpose. Now imagine yourself easily navigating through life's changes and stress from a soul level. For insights into the journey of the human soul, let Dr. Krishna Bada be your guide. His book, Journey from Life to Life, will help you demystify life, death, and everything in between. It gives you clarity on how you can have a successful life and a smooth transition into the world beyond. Who wouldn't want that? Get Journey from Life to Life by Krishna Bada, MD, at Amazon.com. More exhilarating talk. HealthyLife.net. back to Relax Radio. I'm your host, Dan Reardon, with co-host Dr. K and our guest, Tom. We are excited to finish this episode out uh, with Dr. K leading this segment. Take it away, Dr. K. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Tom, welcome back. Um, I think uh, we generally feel that we control our life until we don't. And uh, we feel like everything is under our control. But there is more to that then we can see or perceive there is somebody walking with us, guiding us or, you know, giving us lessons by mm-hmm. making us fall. Uh, in this book that you mentioned, can you expand on this line and any magic moments in your life that uh, you may have had, like minor miracles? Yeah, I, I, thanks for asking, because I've, I've always experienced the kind of unusual thing. Uh, my father was really good at this. He was good at, 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 at just going, making his mind a blank, just dwelling in silence, and he was a creator. He created all sorts of things in his life. Um, I never realized I was good at that, but people at Notre Dame, when I was a philosophy professor, they would say to me, after a few years, they said, you always know the next big topic before anybody else does. You're always working on things and writing about things that nobody else has thought about yet, but it's going to become a big thing. How do you know before everybody else? I said, well, I think it's because I learned to give up control, to surrender control, to actually become more powerful in my thinking and doing. Uh, that when I'm, I'm just running in one direction, I may be running in the wrong direction. I need to slow down. That's the way the, the Oasis Within came to me. That's the way all the books came to me. And a quick story about that. It's really interesting because 
My main character, his name was Walid. I didn't know his name until the third chapter of the book. His, 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 his uncle was Ali. He was often saying, well, Uncle Ali, tell me about this or tell me about that. And Ali would say, well, my boy or well, my friend. He, he wouldn't use his name until the third, the third chapter. And I heard somebody w run up after a storm and say, Ali, are you and Walid all right? And that's how I knew the name of my second major character in my book. So I was at the Washington Speakers Bureau telling everybody the story of how all these, this, 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 this big novel was coming to me. And a lady raised her hand. She said, do you know what the word Walid means in Arabic? And I thought, uh-oh, no, I don't. And she said, well, my husband's Arab. The word Walid means boy. It's like the English word guy. It's a common first name. And if you're writing a coming-of-age story, which it sounds like, about a boy in Egypt in 1934, you couldn't have picked a more perfect name for your character than Walid. And I thought, well, I just heard the guy yell, you know, Walid, are you and Walid all right? Well, so, so it's interesting. They come upon a dead poisonous snake in the desert. I then went and looked it up. Are there poisonous snakes in the desert in Egypt? Yes, there are. They get to Cairo. There are certain cars on the road in 1934. I looked up those cars. They existed in 1934, and they were likely in Cairo. How did I know this? I'd never studied Egypt. I'd never studied 1934. But every I, at the end of the day of writing, I did no research. I just made my mind a blank. The movie played in my head. And at the end of the day, I would fact-check things. Now, it's a reimagined Egypt in terms of who's in power and all that, but all the details were so amazing to the point that when the first book came out, I gave it to a lady from Morocco, and she's looking through the book, and she says, oh, Walid, very good name for your character. And I said, well, I heard it as Walid. And she said, no, 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 the, the word is said Walid. Your, your, your character's name is Walid. And I, so I go home, and I tell my wife, that this lady, Hensel, told me I was mispronouncing my main character's name. And my wife said, well, you know, she's Arabic, so she's probably right. You know, you're probably wrong. And I said, I'm going to say this name the way I heard it in my head. His name is Walid. So uh, a month or two later, I'm at the, uh, Philadelphia giving a speech in the Lincoln Financial Field where they play football. And uh, at the end of the speech, I get in a, a black SUV to take me to the airport. Turns out the driver is from Egypt. Turns out his name is Walid. And I said, pronounce your name for me. He said, Walid. I said, that's the way I, I told him the story about the lady from Morocco. He said, totally different Arabic in Morocco. She was right about Morocco, but in Egypt, it's Walid, like you said. So I got on the phone to my wife really quick. <laughs> So how did I know that? How did I know that? Yeah. There is more information available to us in the world than we have any scientific explanation for. And to access it, we need to learn to embrace silence. We have to learn when to give up control and when to take control. We have to learn how to be open. And then we can be on a great adventure. My story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but you know you said it, you know, in a story format, and that's the beauty I think you have. You know, you say all these uh, profound things in a nice story fashion. Not that you you're making it up because you hear these stories. So there is something mo something more out there than what we see or what we feel with our you know normal feelings. Uh, and I think it's good to be able to tap into that, and that's one of our efforts, how to channelize that in a proper way that people can train themselves. Uh, that's what we are working on, and it's so nice to hear your way of expression. Now, Dan, I that was fun. That was my magic moment, you know, learning to be open to these greater things. And, you know, uh, uh, Dan and, and Krishna, we live at a time in which everybody's talking about freedom. Everybody's talking about liberty. I want to be free. I want my freedom. I want my liberty. Well, I imagine it sometimes as a little boy in the middle of the jungle. Does he want to be by himself? Does he want to be free to do absolutely anything he wants to do? You know, if I'm the little boy in the jungle, I'm going to want plenty of support and partnership and yeah. guidance around me. <laughs> you know, the only, the only true freedom is to be plugged into the deepest wisdom in, in life, not to fight wisdom, not to fight for your ability to do whatever uh, flows through your head, but to, to be in touch with the deepest things so that you use your freedom properly in the world. 
Yeah, you said something there um, about when to give up control, and um, I've thought of it in terms of uh, something I wrote was the thought of signals, and the signals are coming in. It's whether we all pay attention to them or not. And I realized in my life I had, you know, used the mechanism of force in a lot of situations to to make things happen, quote unquote. Yeah. But it was not what I should have been doing. But I felt like, hey man, if, if you if you if you give me the task, I'll make it happen. Or I can I can throw that on my shoulders. But using the yeah. force, I really didn't do what I should have done if I would have yeah. stood back and listened to the signals and and experienced the deeper silence. I would have realized that that was not the thing to pursue, and I would have yeah. gave up the control of it. And yeah. that is a, a kind of indirect opposition in a lot of ways to the way we're all taught and the way the, the whole system is teaching and directing us now. But, Tom, um, you know, that's, you're saying that is deeply, deeply true. I've had the same experience many times. And my father, who was an expert with tools, used to tell me if you're having to force it, you're not using the tool properly. He would say to me yeah. over and over again. And I learned that most of the times when I give up control, I'm not giving up actual control. I'm giving up the illusion of control that's standing in my way. I never had control to start with. I thought I did, so I was a bull in the china shop, like you're, you're saying, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to make something happen, to make something fit, whether it's supposed to fit or not. But the best thing is to give up this illusion of control and listen. The world around us has so much to teach us. Every problem has something to teach us. Well, Tom, this has been a fantastic show today. We're at the end of our time. Um, where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Well, I have a website that's really popular. A former iteration of it won some kind of award from USA Today, one of the top 100 sites on the web. But that was many years ago when there were probably just 120 sites on the web. But these days it's called Tom, T-O-M, V as in Victor, Tom V. Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, TomVMorris.com. Uh, you could, people can connect with me, or learn about my books, shoot me an email through the site. I love keeping track with people, hearing people's questions and comments. I'm on all the social media platforms. You can connect with me on those platforms on the About page on my website. I would love to, to continue to, to chat with you guys and with any of your listeners who want to pursue wisdom in life. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. This show and others will be available on demand at HealthyLife.net, and you can find out more about us at RELAXX.org. Thank you.